right, I think we're on the home stretch, and I will try my very best to keep you and me focused on mask or access instead of food. Okay, so my talk is on bench to bedside, minimizing juxtanastomonic stenosis. And it is really important because we know that it is the stenosis that is the lesion that caused dialysis access dysfunction. So here we see pathologically neointimal hyperplasia in the fistula, which is clinically manifested by AV fistula maturation and dysfunction. And radiologically, we see this stenotic lesion. For AV grafts, we see the graft material in neointimal hyperplasia manifesting as uh, graft malfunction with poor flows. And radiologically, we here see the stenosis. So we need to think, where is this stenosis coming from? And Dr. Galliani gave a very elegant discussion about um, maturation, but vascular access dysfunction, for the rest of this talk, I would like you to think about upstream events and downstream events. And upstream events are events that initiate vessel injury. And unfortunately, a lot of fistulas a lot of um, vessels already have pre-existing arterial venous neointimal hyperplasia due to the urinary environment and other issues even before they have their access created. So we already have a pre-existing poor vessel in many cases, and then we deliberately cause vessel damage. We ask our surgeons to cut the artery and vein to create this anastomosis. So we, we cause vessel injury. And then once the anastomosis is made, we then induce hemodynamic stress that Dr. Galliani talked about, which then promotes more dysfunction. Finally, the fistula is able to heal. We have the nice dilated vein. And then we deliberately cause further injury by necessity by cannulating it with dialysis needles. And every time we do that, we set off the inflammation and coagulation cascade. So these are upstream events that then lead to downstream events. And downstream events are events that occur in, in response to these upstream events. And so we have the response of the endothelial mus and smooth muscle cells to this injury. And what it does is it proliferates and migrates from the adventitia to the intima. So you have the creation of new intimal hyperplasia uh, demonstrated here in this pink cartoon causing the stenosis. On top of that, with the dialysis procedure and all of these events, you have oxidative stress and inflammatory mediators um, releasing cytokines, chemokines, vasoactive molecules that propagate this entire system. So we have upstream events and we have downstream events. And what do we do with it? When we have a patient, they don't say, hey doc, today I have a downstream event, what do I do? And even if we did, what are we going to do? I googled it and I googled the upstream doctor and there's only one upstream doctor, Dr. Manchanda from New York and I actually don't know what he does. And then if you look for downstream events, how do you get help? It's even more dramatic and more aggressive in terminating these downstream events and this is not going to help us. So what we have left is really our vascular access team and our clinical pathway. So we all know we see three patients at least three times before surgery, at the time of surgery, and if the patient develops a problem um, after surgery. So what we can do is we can actually have therapeutics before surgery to modify the endothelium, therapies at the time of surgery, and hopefully these will uh, prevent stenosis. And if the stenosis does occur, then we can actually have therapies at the time of endovascular intervention and with all of these interventions, hopefully we can have good long-term function. So we have our clinical pathway. So what strategies can we apply to these clinical pathways? Well, there are two major strategies, a systemic strategy, which is non-targeted, or a localized um, strategy. So systemic strategies, we can give something intravenously or orally to affect the whole body, and hopefully it'll affect the vascular access. Or we can have localized therapies with endovascular devices, so such as angioplasty, when you in, have an effect going from inside to outside of the vessel to increase patency. Or you can apply a drug that goes from inside of the um, lumen to the outside, so that's an endovascular procedure. Or we can have perivascular um, interventions going from the outside at the adventitia to the intima, uh, perivascular uh, procedures and then novel access options. 
So putting it all together, we have our clinical pathway, we have our intervention, so we can, before surgery, have agents that can act locally um, with antioxidants, anti-inflammatories, anticoagulants, or antiproliferants, either before surgery or at the time of surgery, either locally or systemically. And then at the time of surgery or after surgery, we can have endovascular or perivascular locally delivered therapies, or the surgeon can actually deliver surgical techniques or devices to optimize hemodynamics. And hopefully this will prevent stenosis, and if not, then we have therapies at the time of intervention of the stenosis, such as local antiproliferative therapies, for example, using drug-eluting stents, and again, hopefully this will give us good long-term function. So now that we have these um, different uh, options, let's really quickly take a look at uh, systemic options, and I'm going to cover this in one slide. This is a summary of all the randomized controlled trials looking at oral agents to prevent vascular access dysfunction in more than 50 patients. And really, there are only two key studies that have actually demonstrated any hint of benefit, the Agronox and fish oil studies, which demonstrated an improvement in primary patency or an improvement in the rate of um, loss of the access, thrombosis, and interventions. So really, in terms of oral and systemic therapies, we have further investigation. Uh, to go. So what I'd like to focus the rest of this talk on is on localized therapies. So before I do that, I'd like to just review some of the principle of local delivery therapies. One of the first principles is that we know that both drugs and devices can target upstream biology. Drugs, cells, and biologics can target downstream biology. So, for example, if you have an endovascular procedure, the drug can be applied locally at or near the vein artery or vein graft anastomosis with very little systemic toxicity, so really localized to that lesion. We can have perivascular approaches so that the drug can be applied directly to the adventitia to block the adventitial activation of fibroblasts, and I'm going to show you that in a minute. And one of the key principles is that when we have endovascular and perivascular approaches, we can actually take advantage of the drug concentration gradient and the natural movement of the cells. So what do I mean by that? So here we have a picture of a blood vessel. This is the adventitia, the outside of the vessel, the lumen, the inside. And we know that when vascular injury occurs, cells move from the adventitia to the media to the intima um, to become myofibroblasts or contractile smooth muscle cells. We also know that if we apply a drug on the outside of the vessel, you're going to have a high concentration gradient there and no drug here. So it's going to go down its concentration gradient along with the movement of the natural progression of those cells so hopefully this in combination can limit new intimal hyperplasia. So let's talk first about endovascular therapies now that we have our major principles. This is an endovascular approach using a, a device called the Genie catheter and it targets downstream biology. So let's assume that this, sorry, let's assume that this gray thing is your blood vessel and let's say there's an area of stenosis. This genie catheter is inserted, and before um, you insert it, drug can actually be applied to these heads here. Balloon blocks are then inflated so that when the drug comes out, it doesn't go out beyond the area that you're interested in. So the balloon blocks are inflated, drug is then released through pores that are inside these blocks, and then the drug is filled for two minutes within the area of interest. The catheter is then removed and the drug remains to have its activity. So this is really good and the benefit of this is that you can actually put any type of drug in there, paclitaxel or nitric oxide, anything that you want to deliver there. The other thing is that it's not an angioplasty balloon, so it does not cause endothelial disruption or injury. So this is actually being um, used in, for cardiovascular purposes. Um, and it has approval for cardiovascular and peripheral, but hasn't actually been used for hemodialysis access. So this is something that I think in the future we can actually exploit and use to uh, improve vascular access function. Another device 
uses both an endovascular and perivascular approach. This is the microinfusion catheter, and it really uh, targets downstream pathology. So let's say this is your blood vessel, and you have a, a, a lesion here. What this is is it's a um, a device. It's a bullfrog device with a sheath balloon, and inside this sheath balloon there is a needle that comes out. So if you place it in the area that of interest. You blow up the balloon. You can see that the needle has just come out. And what then happens is that the drug can come out outside, and then it can work inside in as we talk about. This is the only procedure that I know that does this. Otherwise, the only way that you can actually access the outside of the blood vessel is during the time of surgery. So this is quite a brilliant technique where you can actually target the lesion a time away from surgery so that you can deliver a drug from the outside to work in. So since we've started talking about perivascular, let's look at other perivascular options. There's perivascular options for devices, cells, biologics, and what I call voodoo. Uh, so this is one approach looking at a device, the OptiFlow device. You can see that it is a sutureless conduit with phalanges. And the benefit of this is it actually causes a standardized angle, as Dr. Galliani talked about today, that wall shear stress is a very important uh, um, promoter of new intimal hyperplasia. So if we get the right angle, it probably will have better laminar flow. So hopefully with this, um, without sutures and with better flow, we're going to reduce intimal hyperplasia. Now this was studied um, in a first-in-man pilot study, and then this uh, device was sold to another company, so I don't know about future uh, development of this technology. Something that has a very interesting concept in terms of perivascular approaches is endothelial cell implants. So the rationale is that we have endothelial cells in our bodies and that it's not just a cell lining the blood vessel. It's an active living cell that actually produces beneficial mediators such as nitric oxide, prostaglandins, prostacyclins that actually cause dilatation of the vessels. So the concept is if we can actually deliver it to the area where we think there may be neonatal hyperplasia, then it will allow the endothelial cells to do its own thing and have a beneficial effect. So what they, the, the investigators thought of doing was getting allergenic human aortic endothelial cells, cultured them in gelatin in, in a in gel film and came up with a device called VascuGel. So they put this VascuGel on the outside of the artery and vein anastomosis at the time of surgery and in grafts between the, the graft uh, vessel and anastomosis to see if it would have an impact on um, new intimal hyperplasia. They did a, a safety study called the V-Health study that showed no differences in infection, so safe, but the sample size was too small, so they could not show a difference in primary unassisted patency. So they went on to go and have a larger trial to look at this endpoint. It was started in 2013, actually recruited 47 sites who committed to doing this. However, despite its good concept, the main concern was with these allergenic cells that it would cause immunosensitization um, and it would be a problem, particularly for ESRD patients on the transplant list. And due to this, there was huge recruitment issues, and even though it was a good concept, the feasibility was a problem. One very promising agent is pancreatic elastase, again, a perivascular approach targeting downstream biology. So this is something that the surgeon would do at the time of surgery. Um, this vonopanetase is actually dripped on top of the anastomosis. It's done over 10 minutes. And what it does is it destroys the elastin in the vessel wall, uh, permanently creating an increase in vessel caliber. So you can see that before treatment, this is what the vein looks like. Post-treatment, you have this dilatation. So this was tested in an uh, efficacy study of unassisted primary patency of fistulas, and unfortunately, this study was a negative study. Uh, there was no difference in unassisted primary patency. However, they looked at another outcome, which was unassisted maturation of uh, fistulas at 12 um, weeks, and particularly for radiocephalic fistulas, if you look at the Robbins criteria for maturation, which is a vein diameter greater than 4 millimeters and a blood flow greater than 500, those patients receiving 30 micrograms had significantly improved unassisted maturation at 93% versus placebo or the 10 microgram dose. 
So they concluded that although the efficacy endpoint was not met, that there was improved unassisted uh, maturation and that the 30 microgram dose was associated with increased primary patency. Based on that, they just completed the patency one study, uh, which actually the primary endpoint was uh, unassisted maturation, which was a negative study. However, they found improvement in secondary patency, and from this, there's a large ongoing international study looking at vonopanetase with a, a sample size of 600. So hopefully we'll get the results soon. I'm not going to talk because of time limitation about um, other perivascular approaches such as drug biologic combinations and in this particular case glitazone versus the fat complex very very interesting concept being studied by Christy Terry and it's undergoing animal evaluation at this time. I will talk about really briefly uh, another broad perivascular approach using infrared therapy so what this is, is it's infrared radiation applied to the arterial venous fistula after creation. And the concept is that it will reduce hemooxygenase 1, which reduces oxidative stress, and it decreases inflammation by reducing MCP1. This is actually already being used in Taiwan. Uh, patients receive this during dialysis, um, and early studies have shown it actually has shown an improvement in uh, primary failure um, and increased maturation with this device. Subsequent studies have occurred and with that they were able to do a meta-analysis um, and the meta-analysis showed that it does have a positive influence, however, uh, despite this, the meta-analysis was based on randomized controlled studies where the investigators actually had commercial ties. So to really uh, repeat this and repeat studies using blinded randomized controlled trials where uh, investigators did not have ties to far infrared therapy. So I think we need more investigation on this. Lastly, I'm going to talk about uh, novel vascular access options. And uh, because of time, I'm actually going to go through this really quickly. Um, there are other access options available. This is the hemoaxis valve device. Uh, there's a fist assist and really elegant work uh, being conducted now looking at uh, humicite, which is a, a biologic. Um, and because of time, I'm not going to talk about this. Um, I did want to end uh, by closing the loop. Uh, I talked earlier about the endovascular fistula, and I'm very proud to say that with this, that I am the very first nephrologist to create an endovascular fistula even though it wasn't in a human, it was in a, a sheep model. And this is what it looked like after it was created. And you can see that this is the, um, the channel that was created. And this was taken with a cell phone, so it doesn't have the, the best clarity, but it actually has a very, very smooth cut. And so with that, and with, uh, without the vascular uh, torsion and pull during surgery that this may actually reduce new intimal hyperplasia. And in fact, when we actually looked at this under the microscope 30 days after creation, you can see that there's absolutely no new intimal hyperplasia along the fistula tract. And when you open it up and you look at the inside, it looks really, really smooth. So this is in an animal model. Does it actually apply to humans? And if you remember from my talk earlier on, uh, we actually did have to sacrifice um, um, one of the endofistulas due to you know, adverse consequences. And this is a picture that was taken during surgery. This is the endofistula. And you can see that really it's a very, very uh, a clean channel that was created. So hopefully this will then translate into uh, less new intimal hyperplasia and stenosis down the line, which we did see clinically. So to end, um, a key lesion in vascular axis dysfunction is the juxtanastomotic stenosis involving both upstream and downstream pathophysiology. Novel systemic and local perivascular and endovascular studies are ongoing, looking at drugs, devices, biologics, and new creations. And many of these creative AV access options are being studied from bench to clinical trials for future use at the bedside. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Chairman.